Welcome to At The Bell with Derek Poppy Roland. Today's guest is a very, very special guest of mine. Very excited about him coming on the show. He needs no introduction. Can I get a round of applause for Roy Jones Jr.? Well, I'm really glad you decided to come on and sit down with us and talk about boxing and all your achievements and all of that. But before we get into your successes and everything that you've accomplished through boxing, I want to know about where it started from. Well, it started as a 10 year old, and it started really younger than that. First time I saw Muhammad Ali fight Joe Frazier, I was pretty intrigued. And my father was so amazed with Muhammad Ali that it made me become amazed with him, and I was like, wow. What he's doing with his mind, I can do that. If somebody teach me how to use my hands, I can do what he's doing with his mind. Because I had that mental already. So I started asking the box. And um, I didn't know my dad boxed at the time. So he would never let me box, but he would get down in the house on his knees and box with me for a little while, from when I was about six to when I was about nine. And every time he would always send me to bed crying, of course, because I didn't know nobody. I, was, I always wanted to win. But uh Every day I would come back, and it got so bad that my mom would beg me, please don't box your dad tonight. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, I won't. And before I go to bed, it was just an urge that would not let me go to bed without taking that beating, so I had to have it. You understand? So you actually fighting your father at 10 years old? No, no, I was younger than from when I was about six to when I was about 10. Six, okay. Yeah, he would give us an easy box when we had, we had a pair of gloves, but like I said, I didn't know that he boxed for real. Okay, so okay. I always thought I had a chance, you feel me? <laughs> and not knowing that he was a real boxer. My dad fought Marvin Hatton. Okay, okay. I didn't know nothing of this. I didn't, really, I didn't find this out until I got 13. Okay, okay. And I started boxing at 10. Right, right, so, right. So uh, finally when I got 10 years old, I guess he realized that I was willing to take a lick and to keep on taking. Okay. And uh, one day he just started training us. And that was it? That was it. So the big accomplishments that you made, so your first one we must have started in the Junior Olympics then. As the, yeah, some you know, we just some we just found out today. I didn't realize that you won the Junior Olympics in 1984 at Saginaw Valley, Michigan, the same time I did. Yeah, I was, was 125. Right. I was 119. Right. I had no clue. We were right, right by each other. You know, when you, when you win those those tournaments and you focus and you you just worrying about the fight, you're not really worried about the other weight classes. I was one of them focused guys. Me that, too. Me yeah. Too. I mean, it's so much in your weight class that you got to worry about that you don't have time. To think yeah. about nobody else's weight class. The yeah. only reason I remember a few of the heavyweights was because they were heavyweights. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So uh, I forget the kid's name from, he was down in Mississippi for a little while, but I remember him, he won it in the heavyweight division, or super heavyweight one, but that's that's really, and the, the Bell and Terrell Finger, I remember them. Oh, I, I remember, I remember them, I remember uh, Lavelle, Terrell, Lavelle was in your weight that, that, that year. I beat Lavelle. Yeah, because he lost his, yeah, he yeah. lost to Luke over the year before. Yeah, that was in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, all you guys knew about national tournaments. Uh -huh. That was my first one. Saginaw, Michigan, 84. Yeah, yeah. I went to the finals. I took the silver. I lost to Bandel Hinton um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, in 83. Right, right. And then 84, I beat him in the semis, and I won the, um, the gold in 1984. I did not yeah. know that. So you... Did you beat Lavelle in the, in the, in the I finals? I beat Lavelle, I don't know if it was that tournament or it could have been in one of the late, late Classic, but I did beat him mm -hmm. um, in my career as an amateur. Okay. So you got a nice amateur career, you know, went through the J.O. system and that's good. I just asked people I interviewed <coughs> that came straight out like your boy um, Al Cole or your mm -hmm. boy Ray Merson and they came straight from adults. Mm -hmm. 18, they went out the army, so they didn't, do so you and I are similar having that Junior Olympic, it means a lot. It means a lot, a whole lot. A whole lot. So going up into the, um, um, going into the AAU, going into the boxing, and now you're 16 years old, what was just some of your accomplishments as an amateur? Well, in my first, when I turned 16, I, I had, a, I went through a lot of growth spurts for one. Okay. I went from, at uh, 15, I was 119. Okay. That's my one in, in, in uh, second, I was one together. Then uh, the next year, I had a back injury. So I was 125, 132, but my back wouldn't let me do much. So my dad didn't take me to the tournaments at all. Okay. I had a few fights here and there sporadically, but I didn't go to many tournaments. When I got 17, I was 139. And that's when I got to the National Golden Gloves and was it was our Cedar Rapids? Cedar Rapids? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was 39. I thought it was 47, but you know what I mean? Okay. And, uh, it was tough because to get there, I had to be the kid in Knoxville that had been winning the Southern Golden Gloves since I was 13 years old. Okay. And it was Sammy Jenkins. 
Mm -hmm. When I got there, he was still there. Okay. And if you didn't knock him out, you lost. Oh. So first round I come out and we boxing. My first time getting a bloody nose, he blooded my nose. <laughs> Second round we came out, we still going. At the end of the round, I hit him with a four punch combination mm -hmm. and give him eight count. That gives me hope. Right, right. I know if I don't knock him out, I can't win. Third round I came back out, I put it all on the line. I threw everything I shot through my whole gun, right? Mm -hmm. Shot my whole gun. Um, didn't catch him, so I was tired. He pushed me against the ropes, he thought he had me. He went for the left body shot, and as he went for the left body shot, I threw it the best left hook I probably ever threw in my life. <laughs> Boom! The Collapsed him, knocked him cold. And that's how you got that's to the national. That's how you got to the <laughs> I was there with you that year, see the Rockets Iowa, man. I had, it was a rough tournament that it year, a very man. tough tournament because um, they had the likes of Overbeard, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the kid I beat in the Victor Levine, it's mm -hmm. really tough character. Yeah, it was a guy out of Chicago that I forget yeah. his name, but it was a guy out of Chicago that I had fought in the quarters or the semis, man, that was a tough fight. A lot of tough fights. So when I meet Derek Roland from New Jersey, <laughs> I said, Oh man, first of all, he's southpaw. Second of all, he fights like a machine, he just don't stop coming. So how am I gonna beat him? So man, I'm gonna tell you right now, when I saw you coming up, I was like, I wasn't happy to be fighting a guy like you. I was happy, but I knew it was going to be a tough fight. Yeah. And it was, it, the good thing about that year was everybody you fought could have beat you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Me? So everybody was good. Everybody I fought everybody could have beat me. If I was that was there, a big weight class. If I, stepped, if I stepped at all, anybody could beat me. And you were really, you and Victor Levine were the two main ones that I really had to worry about. Mm -hmm. Because Victor had such a big name already. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I had seen him myself on TV on USA Amateur fights, fighting for the United States team mm -hmm. on shows. Oh, so I was see, already, yeah. so I already seen him. I knew he was. He was a good fighter, he was yes, a good fighter. Yeah, but when I saw you, I was like, oh my gosh, he's just as good to me, and he's left-handed. This is gonna be a problem. So <laughs> we had a good one, I, I lucked that I pulled it out, but you was no stops by no means. So it was, a, I appreciate yeah, that, man. I was so good, I, I appreciate that. And I really had mad respect for you before and after because you kept coming the whole time. You know, I was definitely got to deal with too. And I was a hell of a puncher. I didn't look like it, but I really was a hell of a puncher. Mm -hmm. And for you just keep coming at me, keep coming at me, keep coming at me, said a lot about you. I you appreciate know, that. It means a lot. Yeah, come on, brother. <laughs> you know, I, I, I watched your career, man, come up out of that. And it must have been a big, amazing thing for you. You had one up in weight class that year. And then shortly I turned pro, mm. but I watched you throughout the Olympics, man. That must have been real good to represent your country in the United States Olympics, man. How was that, man? What was that about? How did it make you feel to come up from a little kid, man, and now you're representing the United States in the Olympics, man? It was funny because the first time at the Nationals, I'm 119. Next time at the Nationals, we, we fight, I'm 139. Mm -hmm. The following year at the Nationals, I'm 156. Mm -hmm. So people didn't understand I jumped weight class so much because after 119, it was always a struggle for me to make weight. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So when I was fighting 39, I probably should have been 47. Okay. So by the time I got to where I thought I should go to 47, like, why stop at 47? I already weighing 156 most of the time. I'm he heavier than 56, making 47. So why not go on up to, I'm making 39. It sounds so like, like you just going like to eat, six. man. It sounds like, like you just like, like to eat. I just was growing. Yeah, it just yeah, growing. I was okay. growing. So I went up to 56 and I'll. Uh, it was amazing because I won the National Golden Gloves again the next year, which was 87, but in 88, I fought, had a close decision loss to Jim McClellan. Jim McClellan, but, yeah. but to me, it was a political loss because I thought I did enough to win the fight. And I you know close fights like that are gonna happen, especially when you got two good guys, yeah. and in the amateurs, you only got three rounds. But I felt like it was a little bit political because I felt like they knew that Gerald couldn't beat Ray McElroy. Okay. Ray McElroy being from California, which is where the Olympic trials were going to be at. Okay. If he wins this tournament, that's not a Californian in the Olympic trials in California. Okay. Which means okay. more people may come to see. Right? So, the, okay, so it could have been a political. I thought it could have yeah. been. And, and they knew I beat Ray, Ray McGarrow the year before. Okay. In um, Knoxville, Tennessee. So I feel like it was a political decision. But neither the last, it was a really good fight. I can't lie. I kind of really, really, I was roommates in Colorado Springs with Jerome McCullough. Right. He's a nice guy, mm -hmm. cool guy. I really liked him. Yeah. And he was an outstanding fighter. Hell of a fighter. Hell of a fighter. He wasn't nobody to be messing with. I like, I like, I like that. Um, that, that, that could have been 
a final. You and yeah. you and him could have been something real big. You know, shame what happened to him as a pro. Yeah, though, but he anyway, was a good but, champion. Yeah. But back to where I was. So anyway, they give it to him, and by the grace of God, I still make it to the Olympic trial because you know they had back then we had seven ways to get in. And one at large guy who was having a bad Okay, game. yeah, yeah, yeah. And at large guy's the last ranked guy, which was me. Uh huh. So I got that rank number eight. And um, it's crazy because people don't know these stories that God, but God has been for me for so long, Derek, that when I got there, I really wasn't supposed to be there. Just by the grace of God, I met some people, and the people that realized that I had just had a bad year in 88. So they picked me as the at large guy, number one. Number two, when I get there, I got a bum right hand, my right hand is shot. Mm -hmm. Right? So you know Frank Lyles and you know Tim Yeah, 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 yeah. They fought yeah. about probably six to nine times <laughs> on the national scene. Mm -hmm. Frank went just by a woman, right? Frank Lyles was so a dude too. So I'm knowing that if I got to use my bum hand to beat both of them, I probably can't beat both of them back to back nights or one night rest and one night again. Right. But if you separate them in the bracket, well, you ain't got to fight one of them, I can beat them. Or put them, <laughs> hey, put them in the same bracket. Yeah. When I gotta fight one of them, I can beat either one of them. Uh -huh. So, I asked God for one more thing. I said, thank you for getting me here, but I need one more thing. And you know this don't happen. Everybody that understands bracketology knows that this doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I said, you please could put Frank and Tim in the same bracket, so I ain't going to use my hand on but one of them. I can bring <laughs> it back with my left hand. Wow. That's how cold I was and how much I believed in myself. Mm. You feel me? When That's I a that, champion mentality I always talk about. When I that bracket, you believe that? When I went to that bracket, I saw that number one, and number two was in the same bracket, which was Tim and Frank. Mm -hmm. That's all it's over. I didn't wait for y'all, man. The guy came along, mm -hmm. offered me some money in a nice car, and uh, <laughs> I turned pro because I felt they wasn't going. I should have waited for the 80 Olympics. Right. I'd be on that team with y'all, but I, I really thought they had chose uh, Kenneth Gold mm -hmm. already. You know, we fought four times. I believe I won two of the four, but they gave it to him. I was like, you know what? Same thing. Let me just turn pro and go ahead and. And I, by the time y'all came out Olympics, I was already undefeated doing some things, so that was good. Mm -hmm. I never but, went to the Olympics. And, um, got robbed, biggest, the worst decision. Yeah, everybody Olympics, talked so. about that. But you took a silver, you yeah, did. You know, yeah. everybody knew you was a bad decision. I should have took a gold because I beat the hell out of you. So. <laughs> I agree with you. Everybody knew. We talked about that for over a while. But to me, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. One of the better experiences of my life, too. And I just thank God for that too because God knew how to turn me on as a professional. Mm -hmm. He knew what getting that silver medal would do to me mm -hmm. better than I did. I just couldn't understand the blessing at first when it happened. But right. I, later I grew, to under, I grew to understand the blessing within about a week after it happened. Oh, to understand adversity, that's good. Well, that's so so that's the next point. I'm glad you brought that up because what I wanted to talk about next was your transition mm -hmm. from the amateurs <clears throat> excuse me, into the pros. Mm -hmm. I would listen to them, uh, Paulie, I, I commented with Paulie and Tarvo on this thing called Pro Box now, right? Mm -hmm. And I would listen to them talk about the jump from the four round pro fights to the six round pro fights, mm -hmm. right? I never went through all that. My first pro fight, I went eight rounds. Wow, I never knew that. Well, it was scheduled for eight rounds. It didn't go eight rounds, but I was scheduled for eight rounds. My second one was scheduled for eight rounds too. And I never so you skipped to the commissioner? Well, what, that was the commissioner in Florida? Yeah. They know I ain't need no, I fought, I fought over 100 three rounds. What I need a four rounder for? Right, four right. rounder, one round, add on a three right. rounder. Who needs that? I, I most, didn't even think about that. Most know? of us really, really high level amateur guys, right. we used to spar six and eight rounds anyway. All, all the time. So what we going on three rounds, four rounds, four rounds, and one round added to a three rounds. Yeah. If we yeah. can't do that, we're not a top notch guy. I didn't even understand it like that, but that makes yeah, a lot so of I'm sense. Not, I'm not wasting time going on. I think I did two fours, rounds. two sixes. No. Uh, eight and ten to ten, I think. If you don't have amateur, if you don't have amateur experience, then I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. If you got a hundred amateur fights at three rounds, why can't you go four or five rounds? Yeah, you're right. You should Especially be when you're in the nationals fighting, you should be dead. You'll sleep. Yeah. So we do that sometimes too. That's you why I, I fight thought, and go to that's sleep. That's why I knew I can go eight rounds. Yeah. So I started on, I was going eight rounds. Mm. My first fight, pro fight, was getting eight rounds. Wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I didn't go. I just started. So your transition with turning pro, choosing a manager, you know, your, your, your dad was still training you, right, at this time? Training. My dad was still training me. My dad was my manager. Okay, so okay. The only thing different that happened there that nobody knew about was that in the Olympics, with the trainers, Coach Al Tomerson, Kenny Adams, and um, Coach Johnson. I don't know Johnson first name. I forget the first name. I know, I know him. Don't Hank remember. Johnson. I think he's from D.C., Hank right? Johnson. Hank, Hank Johnson. Johnson. Hank Johnson. Hank Johnson. So with the three of them, Coach Adams reminded me kind of my dad because he was on you pretty hard, right? Mm -hmm. 
Coach Johnson was cool. He was really cool. He didn't do change much. He's really cool. I like his brother Marvin Johnson too. But Coach Munson mm -hmm. was the coolest for me because he didn't really say much. He just made you work. You know what I'm saying? So I knew that this was a guy that was going to play a big role for me down the line. So at the Olympics, when I, after I met him, I was like, Coach Munson, give me your number and you keep my number because one day I might need you. And he didn't understand what that meant. And nobody else did not understand what it meant. But I already knew at that point that I couldn't become world champion under my dad's tutelage. Wow, how did that go about you and dad? Was it didn't. was it like a fight or was it like? No, it's just that, it's just that for me, God had given me a lot of signs. Mm -hmm. uh, one being when I was 13, I realized that Howard Davis Jr. I think I started knowing how Dave Jr. was about 13, as a, as from a distance. Yeah, he's from Jersey. He was out in Jersey. Yeah, I met him about 27, but I knew him from a distance, right? His dad was over his career. Mm -hmm. He turned up professional after the 84 Olympics, where he won the Val Barker Cup like I did. He was the most outstanding boxer of the 84 Olympics, not Sheree Lennon. I mean, at 80, Eight, 76. 76, exactly. I was going to cut yeah, My bad. 76 of them. He was the most outstanding boxer, not Sheree Lennon. I know. Well, I like both of them, but he was, more, he was a better boxer on the team at the time. Mm -hmm. When he turned pro, his daddy kind of held him, and held him, and held him, and held him. And by the time they let him fight Jim Watt, which I might be about 13 when that happened, he lost. Yeah, me and my partner, I got a friend named Rodney Price. He's my buddy, mm -hmm. real close friend of mine. And sometimes he wants to you know we train the guys together. And he wanted to go, oh, I'm not ready, and protect him. Like he said, held him, held him. I'm like, no, put him in. Let him see what it's like. Let him do it. All we can do is get better. And I found that I got him to understand it now. It's just a different thing for different people, though. Some people yeah. mature quicker, some people mature later. But the one thing you got to realize about a fighter is when he got that fire, mm -hmm. you can't let that fire fizzle out. Because That's also, right. You and me not in no more. Mm -hmm. He got to have the fire. That's right. When our turn was there, we had to have the fire. Mm -hmm. Now he got it. So when a fighter has that fire, you want to nurture it and kind of guide it. You want to put it too fast. Right. But you don't want to let that fire fizzle out. Exactly. If that fire fizzles out, they will happen. Howard Davis Jr. is dead. Let Howard Davis fire fizzle out. Mm -hmm. And by the time he got there to fight, Jim White, the fire was gone. He didn't want to be no more. He had been pro so long. Like, yeah. I'm just a pro boxer. The fire was gone. That's a good I'm way just a pro boxer now. So it was like, I knew God showed me that for a reason. So mm. when I got about 16, 17 years old, uh, me and my dad finally had come ahead over a few other things outside of boxing. And uh, I called Coach Merck. I said, hey, you remember I told you I was going to need you one day? He said, yeah. I said, well, that day is here. He said, okay, what you need me to do? I said, I need you to come out here Thursday. I'm fighting Saturday. He said, hey, you don't need spawn, you need anything. I said, I mean, don't worry about none of that. You just show up. Was it a pro fight? Yeah, I was fighting Glenn and he Thomas. Undefeated okay. guy, too. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And now he came down, and I was on USA. How did uh, your dad handle it? How did dad, how did dad take that? My dad didn't like it, of course, but at, like I said, we had had some pretty intense moments. Okay. And it was getting to that time, because I always asked God, once again, I always ask God everything. Mm -hmm. Right? And still do, by the way. But okay. I, I asked God, please don't let me stay too long, mm -hmm. but please don't let me leave too early. Wow. So God showed me the three strikes that meant, okay, that will strike one, that will strike two, here goes strike three. Mm. Well, you had so many different accomplishments, man, I can't name them all. Not many people, I don't think anybody ever comes from winning the uh, middle, was the middleweight title one all the way to the heavyweight title. One guy, right? Bob Fitzsimmons, he was the only one. The only one? Yep. And you know who else was close? I don't know, not the heavyweight, but all the way from lightweight to the uh, super middleweight. Uh, Roberto Duran. He was close. He, he came from. He got like seven of them, I believe. There's a lot of guys climbed a lot of weight classes. But what you got to remember is the higher the weight classes go, the higher the difference in weight goes. Oh, yeah, 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 so yeah. That's yeah. why I say always to people that if you talk about pound for pound, mm -hmm. I cover more poundage. Than anybody ever had. Yeah, you got middle, from lightweight, like I mean from middle, middle middleweight. 54 all the way to heavyweight. Which yeah, is all the way. You feel me? Nobody's caught that much weight. Yeah, that was so unbelievable. So, what's Give us all your accomplishments you made, man, all your accomplishments. I, I, I really don't do all the accomplishments, Derek, because <laughs> it's like I was middleweight, I was middleweight champ, mm -hmm. I was super middleweight champ, I was undisputed like heavyweight champ, and I became heavyweight champ. Mm -hmm. More like W, uh, Title, but they don't really count the way they don't really count those. So, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I, I was, I and and because I thought Bob Bob Fitzsimmons had won the middleweight, lightweight, heavyweight, didn't lightweight, 
But I found that I was, I was wrong. He won middleweight, heavyweight. After he lost heavyweight title, then he came back and won a lightweight title. Yeah, yeah. I thought he won him all the way up and came back and recaptured. So I went all the way up and came back and recaptured. Well, you, you, you gave a lot of people, man, the whole country, man, the whole world, man, I might say. Yeah, a lot man. of people enjoyed watching you fight. And well, I enjoyed it, man. Your, your style was different, a little awkward, but very, very uh, exciting to watch. You was like one of the best ever, pound for pound. We always talk about it. Thank you. And you know, sometimes when I'm like, I fought Roy Jones, you know, I thought I'd beat him, man, but, but really the turn to see what boxing done for you and see what you did for boxing kind of made me still cheer for you and right. be a fan of yours, Thank you know, like, well, Roy is Roy, you know, and so he ain't, you know, and I could see that he was just a good dude. So, you know, he good, I cheer for him, yeah. you know, I want him to win. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that I always ask when I get him on the show is like, the show really is called At The Bell. And at the bell, I'm not talking about when the bell rings, you go. My question is, when the bell rings and it's over, like you had all these accomplishments, you started as a little kid, 10 years old, your whole life is boxing, and now you reach a point where, what am I going to do now? It's not over, no, it's over now. Well, for me, that never really happened that way because I was commentating before I retired. Okay, same right. as Kevin Kelly, he got that so off I like that too. So going to go before I got there. But what I didn't realize was, if you remember early, in my early days, I had a fighter by the name of Smoke Gainer. Smoke Gainer? Derek Smoke Gainer. I he know became, Derek Gainer though. He became, he became yeah. a WBA featherweight champ. Okay. He fought Freddie Norwood for the title. Okay. That was all my doing. You were training him? Training him okay. and pretty much calling shots for his fights. That was all my doing. So I was training and promoting and commentating while I dominated. Mm. Do you understand? So okay. I'm already doing all this while I'm dominating my, the, the pro division myself. Okay. So when I got to the end of the boxing part, you I, still knew, I knew it wasn't over because I'm already into all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've been training people already. I've been doing promoting already. You understand me? I've been doing commentary already. So. It's just a matter of me having time to do more of those things mm -hmm. than actually fighting them. So it was kind of a smooth transition for me. Um, the boxing part was hard because still to this day, with these guys doing these exhibitions and stuff and making so much money, it's like you got an opportunity to make millions of dollars. Why would you turn it down? You kind of answered my next question before I answered it. <laughs> but, but what I wanted to say, like when you're not fighting and everything, you know, and you had to make these 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 other avenues of things. So now you're not fighting, you're not training, or you're doing a whole lot of other stuff. What would be the need for you? Because you're still making money, so it couldn't have been the money thing. So I wanted to ask you, face to face in front of the whole wide world, what in the world made you go in the ring with Mike Tyson? Me being Roy Jones Jr., being a daredevil <laughs> all my life. Uh, a dead devil. You life. know Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson. You know. Dead devil my whole life. <laughs> give, me, give, me, give me what they say I can't do, and that's what I'm gonna go do. Yeah, I, I feel the attitude. That's what I, I really do. I've been my whole life. Whatever y'all tell me I can't do, guess what? I'm gonna try that's to what do. That's I think I'll go try to do next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how God bless me. That was that's it, man. Feel, that was so. it, man. I really expect. I really enjoyed you, man. I really you, appreciate man. you coming on the show, taking the time, allowing me to come up in here no and talk to you. I wanted to ask you though, because there's a lot of fighters that's uh, young fighters that's coming out of the amateurs, going professional, and what are some of the things you would like to give to them if they were watching you, young 18 year olds or guys that's getting ready to turn pro or looking to turn pro, what should they do? What should um, be some of the things you want to give them? One thing you do is, people say that some people are crazy and everybody has, has their different ways of doing things and the same road is not for everybody. I started out early promoting myself, managing, well not promoting, but managing myself kind of, and I uh, didn't later promote myself. And the reason I did that is because I didn't want to be the guy who ducked and dodged fighters or didn't provide the people with the best fight ever. So as a kid, one of my favorite fights that never happened because the kid died before it happened was Salvador Sanchez versus Isidio hmm. Pedros. Oh yeah. Salvador Sanchez died in the Car crash. Then Jose Pedro got beat by um. I wouldn't know what it was more like it was a car crash. Oh, okay. Then Pedro got beat by the kid from I don't know. I can't think of his name. Nobody knows because I always talk to him every time I see him. 
So that fight never happened. And I said that if I ever got in that position, I didn't want what happened to me as a kid to happen to another kid and he would not get to see his favorite fighter in, in the biggest fight that was, could possibly happen for his favorite mm -hmm. fighter. That's why when I got close enough to fight James Hunter, I took it right away because he was 44-0, I was 27-0. What kid watching us come up would not want to see that crash. Wow. So it's all about creating an east and a west or a north and a south, mm -hmm. you feel me? That's why every most major sports are broken up into divisions. Mm -hmm. You got the American League, National League, and baseball. Right. You got the AFC, NFC, and football. You feel mm -hmm. me? Mm -hmm. You got the East and the West in basketball. Mm -hmm. Because the goal is to create two championships and make them collide at the end. Wow, like that's that. what everybody wants to see. I like that. So when you get to this point, and this point, you have to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me. Sorry, and I'm not. I'm just saying this way I, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to keep boxing going because that's what I had understood to be. Mm -hmm. Tamahara and Shigway Dunn. You know what I'm saying? They both rose, they collided. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest fights of all time. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So it's like some guys just come up and get to that spot. Some guys do both of them do the same thing at the same mm -hmm. time. In this case, they both kind of came together to that spot. Yeah, and it seemed like, you know, then one of the things I was going to go into right after this question was what about today's boxers and what do you think about some of the guys? That's what I'm going. Yeah. That's what I'm going. So mm -hmm. right now we have Earl Spencer and Terrence Crawford. And they're not trying to meet, though. We can't get a crane to pull them together. Yeah, I wonder what everybody's talking about. And we can't, we can't put them together on the winch. Yeah. And we don't understand why, you feel me? But yeah. use this political too, but I don't want to be that person. That's why I control my own fate. Okay. Because anybody said they want to fight me, they got a chance to fight me. Ain't that you so. understand me? So it's like, David Tedesco asked me to fight, he got to fight. Mm -hmm. Andrew Gattaro asked me to fight, he got three fights. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. asked me to fight and I could, we're going to fight. That's yeah. just who I was. So I mm -hmm. felt like you're supposed to play king of the month. That's right. But if you're the champ, be the champ. But if you think about it, what happened was after me, we all wanted to pack out Mayweather for it. And you can't blame Mayweather for what he did. He's a moneymaker. Yeah. Best yeah. moneymaker of all time. Right, right. So he chose to go to the moneymaker side rather than the king of the hill side. Okay. And he made way more money than any of us ever going to make in Right, right, you know right. What I mean? But it diminishes the sport in the sense that now everybody's after the money more so than they're after the king of the hill who's the best. Mm. Yes, damn it. So now, gotta find a middle somewhere. Cause you want water down because they yeah. start to make money, and that's what they want to do. So now they think, oh, we gotta stay undefeated to make money. I mean, you don't take no chances. He took chances. He did what he had to do to get to that point. They just didn't see him do those things, but he took chances to get to that point. Now, yeah, when he got to Pacquiao, he held up a little bit because he probably thought Pacquiao was juicing, mm -hmm. and he probably didn't want to deal with that. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it just you know. Well, oh, do we, we, we give, give Pacquiao some more hard fights and let him get, you know, a little down, then catch him going down. That's, that's part what of the can, game. That's kind of what happened too, but yeah. still, that's not how I do it because mm -hmm. I don't want that. You know what I mean? I want you at your best mm -hmm. because if I don't beat you at your best, then I haven't done anything. I, I like that. I couldn't like that. You feel me? <laughs> I like that. But, but for him, he did it small for him because he was more to make the money. Mm -hmm. And look what kind of money generated for him. Yeah, but that's yeah. him. He was cut out to do that. I'm not cut out to do that. So who do you think will win between Chance Crawford and Earl Spence? Don't know. It's a tough fight to call. I like both of them. Um, people think I don't like Terrence Crawford. It's not. I mean, they don't think I don't like uh, Earl Spence. That's not true. Mm -hmm. I think Earl's a great fighter. Yeah. Earl was one of the guys I heard that gave maybe with all he wanted a couple times. Born. Okay. I heard maybe they got it back, but I heard they gave him all he wanted a couple times. So Earl's been a good fighter too. I just not have. Se I just haven't seen Earl have to be as versatile as I've seen Crawford be. Right. So right. three not my my my. I'm favoring Crawford a little bit. Because I've seen him be more versatile than I see Earl have to be. Right. But at the same time, you could also say that because of his versatility, he had to do that. All right. Earl may not have had to be versatile because he's still undefeated. But then the layoff, too. The layoff, some kind of way. Layoff, the car wreck, but yeah. he's still undefeated. But he only fights his one style. His style is pressure. Right. So right. will Croft be able to make him deviate from that pressure style? Or. Will that person not be too much for Crawford? That's the real question. Yeah. That's why we all want to see the fight. So it's like, yeah, I've seen Crawford be more versatile, but that don't mean he's going to beat him because he still got to make Earl, force Earl to get out of his one, one way of fighting that we've seen right. and make us see can Earl fight in another way. So who would you think is the baddest of the day, though? Today? Right now. Of all of them? Yeah. Hard to say. It'd be, to me, it would be between Terrence and Canelo. Canelo. Yeah, between Canelo. Canelo's been Canelo. there a long time. That's man. why, he's that's still why doing that's it. Terrence have too, though. He yeah. just haven't fought the name of the opponents that Canelo fought. Right, which right. is why you kind of got to lean toward Canelo. But 
they both to me would be the, them two. I mean, it, it's some really good fighters out there. There's a lot of guys that really have like it's a guy called Boots Ennis is on his way up right now. That's gonna be on that level, I think, pretty soon too. But from from just from what I've seen, uh -huh. the past probably ten years, I would go with Crawford, Lomachenko, and, and uh, Canelo. Do you think Ugas got a shot? I think Ugas got a shot, but uh, I think Spence is. Spence is very strong with the way he fights, and I don't know that Ugas can stand up to that pressure. Because mm -hmm. I've seen Ugas to hurt, and I've seen Ugas down. Yeah. And Spence, if you can't take it, he's he going to find out because he's coming. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah. Right. So we're going to find out that too. But that's what I'm saying. It's such a good fight because Spence is really, like I said, he's a really good fighter at what he does. Mm -hmm. And he fights a smart way for a softball because he just keeps that pressure. You understand yeah. me? Yeah. And uh, he has to punch and decide to back it up. So any fight he has, any fight is going to be interesting. Right, and, right. Uh, I, just, I, 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 I think Ugas can fight, man. I like Ugas a he little bit. He can fight. I think people may not count him out a little early, but I mean, I mean, you know. Now listen, I didn't count him out because he's, he's a Cuban. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. never count the Cubans out. You know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm just saying that I don't know that he can take the pressure. Yeah. Or the punch from from uh, Spence because Spence is not your average pressure guy. He's a top notch, top level. Pressure guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he does. Yes, it's pressure. So. We're at the bell. Derek Poppy Roland and Mr. Roy Jones Jr. Man, I want to thank you. That really means a lot to me. Thank you, I always be there for you. I hope I can get a chance to talk to you and of see course. you again. Of course. If we you know, later on, I got a couple guys that uh, you know that you know former champions. Talk to like Buddy McGird and other we guys that yeah. I want to kind of trying to bring together, man. We'll talk. I will thank you. I will do what I can to make it happen. Uh, I like this. this is at the bell with Derek Poppy Roland. Like, share, and subscribe. At the bell, Dark Pop and Roll Line, Roy Jones Jr. What up, this is your boy Roy Jones Jr. and you're watching At the Bell. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs>